Now we come to our fourth in this series of messages on David, our fourth overall message, and we come to the second message in the overview of the life of David. Father, would you help our study today as we continue now? In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. Now we've been again looking on the last message about David as a shepherd. David as a shepherd. And I said to you that God prepared David through being a shepherd to lead Israel. God prepared uh, compared Israel to a flock uh, at one time. And so God raised David up and he prepared him. He taught him through handling sheep to handle his people. And there's a great message in that because uh, as a pastor, many of you preachers, as pastors, you are uh, to pastor the flock of God, you see. And the, the pastoring the sheep or leading the sheep is the same word as, as pastoring. Psalm 25, verse number 12 says, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. And so the Lord gets to choose in life how he prepares somebody to do his work. And so when David was pastoring the sheep, it's the same thing as pastoring a flock of people. He had to take care of that sheep. Now I want you to notice some things about that. First of all, I want you to notice the rod and the staff. Now Psalm 23, verse number 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now two tools that the shepherd had was a rod and a staff. Now the rod was a little short club that the shepherd would use to fight off animals. And that rod, every boy that wanted to be a shepherd in Israel would go and cut down uh, his own rod. And uh, he would practice with that rod. He would practice throwing that rod. And so uh, he'd cut down. Now the rod in the Bible is a type of the Word of God or a type of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember Aaron's rod that budded. Now wait a minute. Now you say, preacher, you just said that he cut down his own individual rod. That don't mean everybody's got their own individual version of the Bible. But what it does mean is every every Christian in America, at least, uh, can have their own personal Bible. Every shepherd had his own personal rod, but he would train with that rod. He knew how to throw that rod. He knew how to make that rod effective against the enemy. Let me ask you a question. Do you know enough about the Bible to defeat the enemy, the devil? Now, you're not to defeat uh, people you go to church with. I, I, I've had preachers, uh, they'll get a big long list of scriptures up. And they'll say, boy, I'll lay it on them with this. I'll give them this right here. Well, let me tell you something. I, I don't get any things like that. Amen? Uh, I'm not going to give you a list of scriptures to go and fight somebody with. We're not to use the Bible on each other. Uh, we're, we're in the same army, brother. Amen. We're, we're not to use the Bible to cut each other down. We're to use the Bible to build each other up. Now, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. We're to go to that man in meekness. Now, but you see here, David's rod was something that he'd practiced with. He knew how to throw it. Now, I, I think this. I think we as preachers, and, and for years, I didn't know how to throw the rod. I, I, I threw the rod at the people. I, I didn't realize the enemy is the devil. Now, I'm to speak truth, and I'm not to compromise on sin and, and all that, but I'm to speak the truth of God in love. And I'm to know as a preacher, through following the leadership of the Holy Ghost, I'm to know when to say something and when not to say something on the radio. And God help me in my rest of my years that I have that I will not preach uh, with a cutting edge upon my ministry that I have preached in years past. Now, I've not compromised. I believe the same things I believe when I started. Matter of fact, I told uh, one of the staff members this morning, I'm not going to change my mind on what I believe. I'm too old to do that now. I don't debate scriptures with anybody. Uh, I don't sit and I don't get on social media. If That's your business, but I'm not going to sit and debate doctrine and debate issues. I, I have too much to do. I'm like the late Dr. Lester Roloff. The world is too cold not to be bold, and the hour is too late to debate. Amen. And so I'm not going to debate people. I'm going to preach. Amen. But now here's David. He had that rod. And by the way, the rod was a good thing. Now the staff was a longer uh, shaped uh, uh, a stick, and it had a crook on the end of it. Now, what they'd use the staff for, if a sheep got up under something, 
uh, like a thicket or something like that. Uh, then they would take that staff and they would pull that sheep out of that thicket. Uh, many times the shepherd would walk along with the sheep and especially if that sheep had strayed or something and he had to go back and get him, uh, that shepherd would just reach out sometimes to the sheep and mm, get this and touch him on the back with that rod of uh, that staff. Now that staff is a type of the Holy Spirit. How many times in our walk in life have you felt lower down than a snake's belly in a wagon rut. I mean, you were there, buddy. You were low. And all of a sudden, you felt the touch of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I like that song, don't you? Shackled by a heavy burden neath a load of guilt and shame. But the hand of Jesus touched me and glory to God, I am no longer the same. Amen. Hey, I tell you what, I'm glad he touched me, ain't you? I'm glad he not only touched me for salvation, but he touches me for service. Amen. I'm glad he touches me in many ways. He touches me in the storm sometimes. Praise God for the staff. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now the shepherd would use that staff for many things. The work of the Holy Ghost is used for many things. So the shepherd had some tools to work with. You and I have tools to work with. And the psalmist even said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, if it gets so bad that I can see death's shadow over there, I got the rod and I got the staff and they'll comfort me. Amen. How many times have you been near death? Uh, you know, you know. I'll be honest with you. We had one of our own uh, just the other day here in the ministry pass away suddenly. And I got to tell you, it grabbed me. And it still bothers me. And I still don't understand. But it's not for me to understand, brother. God's on the throne. God knows what's right. God knows what's needed, friend. And that, that staff, that Holy Ghost of God will come by and comfort you in the midnight hour. Amen. The Bible said, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Amen. Now, this, the, the second thing I want you to notice, not only David's tools, his rod and his staff, I want you to notice David's courage. Now, David's a young boy, and we, we pointed this out before, but here he's got seven brothers. I, I don't know where they were. Uh, you know, uh, maybe they're off playing games or something. I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're playing basketball. I don't know what they're doing. But David is the keeper of the sheep. Now, this is David's the youngest of the boys, probably 17, 18 years old. And here's David out there keeping sheep and... Uh, as he's keeping the sheep, uh, you got to remember there's several things out there. The land is in turmoil. Saul is a terrible king. Uh, he's running a terrible administration. The Philistines are raiding the Israelites, and no doubt David had to protect his sheep from them. And then David had some other things happening. So David gives us a little bit of insight in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 34. 1 Samuel 17, 34. Now this is when David was getting ready to go face Goliath and David's talking to Saul and Saul said, you, you can't go up there and fight this Philistine. And here's what he said. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep uh, and there came uh, a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. The Bible said, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered, uh, the Bible said, it out of his mouth. And when uh, he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and slew him. And uh, the Bible said, and, and smote him and slew him. Now, wait a minute. Here is David. He's out there attending the sheep. And one time a bear comes. And another time it's a lion. And they steal a lamb out of the flock. Now, I, I thought about this as I was just reading that to you. Eliab, in that same chapter, said <coughs> to David, uh, <coughs> who is that, uh, who, who's you left those few sheep with in the woods? Eliab hated those sheep. Eliab didn't want nothing to do with those sheep. Oh, that's a dirty thing. By the way, a shepherd was an abomination to the Egyptians. Egypt's a type of the world. I believe Eliab had a little world in him, don't you? Anybody hates sheep, anybody hates God's people, why, brother, something's wrong with you. Amen. But of old Eliab, he, and so, but David didn't feel the same way. You see, now if it had been Eliab, Jesse's oldest son, and a bear that got the lion in the, in the mouth, he'd have said, Smokey, go ahead and you can, you can have that lamb. David didn't say that. The Bible said David, went. he told Saul, he said, I went out after him. I 
played offense. I went after what was mine. I, I wish God's preachers again would go after what's ours. I mean, listen, if we believe in fundamentalism, we believe the King James Bible, we believe in moral uh, 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 holiness for this nation, I, I wish we'd go after what's ours again. The devil has took some of some of God's uh, uh, heritage and put it in his mouth, and we ain't even got enough courage to fight the devil. Amen? Why, brother, we just sit back and let anything come and say we can't do anything about it. I believe you ought to vote. Uh, in the voting booth, I believe you ought to stand for what's right. I believe you ought to pray. And me and I believe you ought to preach. Amen. And I tell you what, the government has no right telling you what you can preach in your church and what you can't preach in your church. Amen. I mean, listen, brother, we got the same problems in America right now that our forefathers left England, amen, 300 years ago for. And if we don't get some stick em about us, we don't get some fight about us, we're going to lose everything we got, amen. These bunch of compromising preachers that have switched Bibles, and, and I'm not ugly with you, I'm not, I don't want to be mean to you, but I'm just saying to you, you better get the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost on your life, and brother, this, this contemporary church movement and all that, it will not, it will not stand the test. When the battle gets on. And I tell you what, it took a real man of courage. Now David could have sat back. David said, I got to do something. By the way, David didn't have any help. Sometimes when you stand for God, you'll take a stand by yourself. Did you know that? Why, I found out today that a lot of the brethren, they're not going to stand on anything. You know why? They don't want to be political. I mean, they don't want to get in the middle of something. They don't want to get hurt by nothing. They don't want to take a stand on anything. Let me say this to you. I, I don't have to stand uh, ugly and hateful, and I'm not going to do that. But you make no mistake, I will stand stand against sin. This ministry will stand against sin, and I'm going to preach the Bible, amen, whether people like that, whether they don't like that, whether they listen to me or whether they don't listen to me, whether they give or whether they don't, whether they support or whether they don't, I'm going to preach the Word of God. I'm going to go after what's God's and what's mine, amen. So if the bear and the lion of the devil come and try to take the flock of God, somebody say, well, I don't think we're supposed to hold the fort. Well, you better read the book of Jude. The Bible said we're to earnestly contend for the faith. I think we ought to say more about our King James Bible in our churches. Amen. We got fundamentalists now studying after some of these perversions of the Bible. I wouldn't study that mess. I wouldn't have one of them in my home. Amen. I don't need to know what these other versions say. They were taken from an 1881 perverted Westcott and Hort text. I don't need to know what they say. I need to know what God says. Amen. But here's David. And so it didn't just happen one time. Now the devil will not leave you alone. Now, now, one time, it may happen another time, it'll happen again. The buyer came first, I guess. And then here comes the lion. And he does the same thing. What did David do? David rides up and kills that lion. By the way, it's a pretty brave man to kill a lion. Amen. Amen. It's, pretty brave. it's a pretty brave man to, to kill the lion. Amen. I mean, listen. Amen. I, 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 I tell you right now, pretty brave man to kill a buyer. Amen. I mean, not everybody's ever killed a buyer or a lion. Thank God for some that have, amen, if they needed to, if it was attacking them or something, amen. But anyway, here's the deal. That David, David, David had courage. And, and let me say this. One fellow said this. Courage is not the opposite of fear. I want you to understand what courage is. Courage is acting in spite of fear. There, there are things I'm afraid of. They really are. There are things that I'm afraid of. Uh, I don't like blood. I don't like to see people bleed. I don't like water and fire. I'm afraid of rivers, and I'm afraid of fire. Now, I'll tell you what happened one day. I'll give you a personal illustration. You talk about courage, acting in spite of fear. I was, I was pastoring a church in Dobson, North Carolina, many years ago now. Me and my wife had just first gotten married, and my wife, was she, had, she was helping in a Christian school some miles away. And that afternoon, I had uh, told Mama, I said, I'm going to come up home and stay with y'all all afternoon, and I'll never forget it. Mama had fixed me some pinto beans. She knew I liked pinto beans. And Mama come got me and she 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 uh, she brought me up the house and fixed me some pinto beans. And and we sat there and just talked and had a good day. And, uh, and so I got ready to go to church that evening. And about the time I was getting ready to go to church, Mama came up to my room and she said, Ricky, something's wrong with your daddy. She said, you need to get down here. She said, blood is just pouring from him. You need to do something. And I got there, and Daddy wouldn't listen to her. And, 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 and I said, Daddy, I'm, I'm calling the, the EMS. I'm calling the paramedics. And so I got him there at the house, and uh, Daddy, Daddy didn't want to go to the hospital. And he just didn't want to go. And, and my Daddy weighed 180 pounds. Now, I don't know how I did this. I could never do it again. I don't think I could. They had Daddy laying there on the, on the bed, and they wanted him on a stretcher. And Daddy didn't want to go to the hospital. 
I reached down and grabbed my 180-pound daddy. I scooped him up and threw him on that stretcher. And that, that, that Hamlet's driver was so impressed with that, he went out there and told my brother, he said, you, you get that man in there. I want him to go with me to the hospital. He said, that man's going to ride up front with me in, the, in, that, in that EMS unit. Well, you know, come to find out they, they never they, they got daddy's problem fixed or never really could find out what was going on with him. But here's the deal. You know what I did that day? I acted in spite of fear. I didn't act the opposite of fear. I was scared to death. My daddy is bleeding. I thought he was going to die. I was scared to death. And brother, when you get scared, you'll do something. Amen. And you might do something extraordinary. Somebody said, well, what that was is extra adrenaline. I don't know what it was, but I acted. And I think that's the way David was. I think David was human. We look at men in the Bible. And if we're not careful, we'll look at them as being superhuman beings. And they, or they're not. Their nose ran just like ours. Their feet stank just like ours. Amen. Uh, their head itched just like ours does. Amen. They had to have a haircut. <laughs> That's right. Amen. They had to take a bath just like we do. That's right. And let me tell you about David. When old, when old Leo and Smokey came by, the lion and the bear, I tell you right now, David was scared to death. Ain't no doubt he was. He was scared he was a human. But you know what he did? He acted in spite of fear. God give us some men in this day that will not be reckless in what they say or do, but God give us some men that will have the courage to stand against sin and will stand in the pulpits and in the churches and preach the Word of God. And I want to say this, that we need courage in this day and hour. We absolutely need courage. The average pastor is scared to death today. He's scared of a preacher. If I say anything, they're going to leave. This is going. I mean, listen, the church is not a competitive place where that, where that you, uh, you know, today churches just trade members. There used to be a time man couldn't leave a church and go over and join another church and everything be okay. I think we'd be better off if we got back to some of that. Amen. If a man leaves Jim's church and goes to Jack's church, Jack ought to try to find out what that man's doing there. He ought to call Jim and find out what went on. Amen. That's right. But anyway, I'm moving on now. And so I want to say now here, David had courage. Amen. He sure did. Amen. Now, I want to show this. David's trust in the Lord. Boy, David just trusted God. Notice what he said in 1 Samuel 17. Now, you've got to get a picture of what's going on here. Here's an ungodly Philistine that's been out there for 40 days and 40 nights, which is the number of testing in the Bible. And this ungodly Philistine's cussing and carrying on and, and defying the armies of Israel and defying the living God. Now there's Saul. Boy, wasn't he something? I mean, he was a king, backslid, amen, as a, as a $3 bill. I mean, he was backslid and running a reckless kingdom and had all his soldiers out there and all of them were scared to death. And those three brothers of David, Shammah and Elab and Aminadab were there. And here's David, the eighth son of Jesse, a little, little 17, 18 year old boy. There's men 40 and 50 year old in that army. Oh, Abner was a man of war. I mean, they were men that was men of war. These men, and yet they're sitting there scared of a man nine feet tall. First of all, I just want to say this about that man. First of all, most of the time when you put a great big man up like that to fight, he couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper sack. What's a man nine feet tall going to do to you? Why, he can't run you through the forest. He's going to hit his head on an oak tree and die. Secondly, I'm going to give you this. A preacher pointed this out one day. I thought it was pretty good. Did you know the word champion? Now, we use the word champion quite frequently. Uh, me and my brother growing up, y'all forgive me, won't you, on the radio for mentioning this, but we used to watch that wrestling on TV. And they'd say, ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, the world heavyweight champion. And, and, you know, and, and people use that champion. Uh, they, they want a championship. Or they won a, uh, this, did you know that word's only found, listen to me now, the word champion is only found one time, I believe, maybe, or maybe three times it's found in the scriptures. But you know what it refers to? The Philistine giant. So I don't really want to be a champion. Amen? Because that man was wicked as a devil. I really don't want to be a Philistine champion, all right? So you can use that word. It's a worldly word, I think. But, uh, but anyway, so here's the deal. Man nine feet, three inches tall. And, and, and David knew something that the rest of them didn't get a hold of. David knew this man was defying God. And I want you to notice what David said. You talk about a man of courage now. In 1 Samuel 17, 36, the Bible said, Thy servant uh, slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. I want to go back. Seeing he hath def uh, defied, I'm sorry, the armies of the living God. The Bible said in verse number 37, David said, 
moreover the Lord that uh, the Bible said that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Saul wouldn't have knew who the Lord was if he'd met him in the middle of the road. He's just using some of that fake Christianity language, you know. Well, go, go, and you know, the Lord be with you, you know. And uh, but he's backslid as he could be. And so, but here's the deal. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, and I, I believe he was on his way to backsliding anyway. He was after the flesh. And in the next chapter, he was going to really backslide. But anyway, here's the deal. So Saul goes, David goes out there. And David has courage. You know what David said? That giant's going to be just like the lion and the bear. And I'm going to say, if God's ever delivered you from a battle or a trouble or an enemy, then it has given you great courage to carry on. Amen. I have had God deliver me from things. I've had God deliver me from people. I've had God deliver me from stuff. I've had God pull my feet out of the net at the spare of the moment. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for He shall pluck my feet out of the net. I've had God do so much stuff for me that I know God's real. I know God's right. I know God is ready. Amen. And I know that God is regular. He's faithful. Amen. I know that God regards me. Amen. Yes, sir. I know that God will revenge me. I don't have to take vengeance upon people when they you say, Preacher, I'll do you wrong. I don't have to take vengeance on you. I'll let the Lord do that. Amen. I'll tell you one thing. When God gets done with you, it'll be worse than it would be if I got, got a hold of you. Amen. I'm not going to touch or fight anybody. I'll let the Lord do that. Amen. And I tell you, you know what David did? David said, I can, I, I can do this because the Lord's going to be with me. Amen. I wish some of us again today in our hour, I wish some of us would rely on God again. I wish some of us would really rely on God. We're so uh, politicky in Christian circles. We're so political. We talk about Washington, but I tell you the truth, the church is just as bad. And I, I don't mean to be ugly, but I'm just simply saying there's so much, uh, well, under the circumstances, I think we ought to do this or we'll do it. I mean, churches get without a pastor and they reason out who they need. They want a young man so he can entertain the youth and get the young people in. They want to build the church of uh, themselves. I tell you what the Bible said. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain to build it. What we need in America is God. What we need in America is a holy presence of God Almighty. We were better off in this country when we relied on God for the weather. We said, oh God, it ain't rained in a while. Would you give us rain? I was reading in the Bible last night. David had a famine in, in, in his days for three years. David waited three years before he ever sought God for the reason of that famine. I mean, listen, brother, when we have things, we ought to ask God, God, what's going on? Have we, have we done something wrong, Lord? You say, oh, God, don't judge like that. Oh, yes, he does. God said he had this way in the whirlwind. Sometimes I believe God sends storms on people. Sometimes I believe God sends things on people for the way they live. I know this. Listen, uh, there's a chastening side to God. But here, God sent this Philistine 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, Israel's just sitting over there like a bunch of puppets, and he had held them captive. Why, nine feet, uh, three inch tall man. He had a coat on, weighed 50 pounds. Why, man, David David was smarter than all them others. David knew a man with a 50 pound coat on ain't going to run far. Hey, I don't care how strong he is. You, you, know what, you know what old Goliath was? He was a show. And brother, I'm going to say this to you. We got a lot of stuff in that America. But listen, God gives some, you know, David had some courage. Would you have had the courage to went out and fit the giant? Listen, we have tucked this story and made it almost where it don't seem real. But ladies and gentlemen, this story is as real as John 3, 16. There's a man defying God and David has enough courage to go do something about it. Amen. Psalm 125, verse 1. The Bible said, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion which cannot be removed, but uh, abideth forever. Verse number two says, The Bible said, As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about, the, the Bible said, His people from hence, uh, from the Bible said, henceforth, even forever. Can I say this to you? As long as I stay, and I'm not talking about now losing your salvation, but, I, but I, I do believe this. I believe when you get backslid on God, I believe God can withdraw His hand and you can have some real problems. But I believe this. God's got a hedge about me like He did Job. And I believe if a man will stay with God, 
I tell you right now, there ain't nothing going to happen to you that God don't allow to happen. And if God allows it to happen, it's God's will. And I said this to somebody today. It's not necessarily how much faith you have. So I said, oh, if you've got enough faith, you can do anything. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible did say if you had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you could remove mountains. But Paul said, if I had the faith, that I could remove all mountains. The apostle Paul didn't even think he had that much faith. And, and if he ain't got that much faith, I don't think there's no uh, 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 charismatical leader out there that's got that much faith. Amen. It's not according to how much faith you have sometimes. Sometimes it's according to what the will of God is. Now here, the will of God was that this giant be destroyed. This giant was an enemy of Israel. I wish America would face her enemies again. I wish we'd quit playing with our enemies. We're the laughing stock of the world. You know that, right? People just laugh at us because we play around under the idea of freedom and democracy. We use that when one-sided against our enemies and we want to just love everybody. And you know know what the root of all evil is, the love of money, right? But I don't have to go there. So uh, I'm going on. But anyway, uh, here's David, his courage. Now, I want you to notice another thing. I want you to notice David's work ethic. Now, we've already really covered this, but David's the eighth son of Jesse. He's out there working. And the first part of 1 Samuel 16, 11, the Bible said, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy um, uh, children? And he said, There remaineth yet the uh, youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Well, you know what? Now, the word keepeth there, it means to pasture, as I said, or, or lead, or to shepherd the flock. It means to shepherd. It means, to, it means a herdman. It means a, a companion. Basically, oh, David was a companion of the sheep. And, but David was a worker. While the rest of them were at the house, David's out there working. I'll tell you, God still blesses work in the hour you and I live. The government may not believe that. Our communistic-leaning government may not believe that. They may be handing out money right and left, but I'm going to tell you God still believes in work. And you that sit around and draw a check and you could be doing something for God, shame on you. Amen. A man ought to work. Amen. A man ought to put an honest day's work in on his job. He ought to not see how... You know, You know. I heard them, somebody was talking about this the, uh, uh, yesterday. Talking about a church didn't have a pastor. And, and, and the man said, we've interviewed preachers and said, the first thing they come and ask us is how much do you pay? If I was on the pulpit committee and the preacher come in and the first thing he asked me was how much do you pay? I'd get up real politely. I'd open the door. I'd say, sir, you see that door? He'd say, yes, sir. I'd say, go through it. You say, well, preacher, that's mean. It's just as mean as that man come down to the house of God and want to know how much money he's going to get and how many benefits he's going to get. Men want the money, but they don't want to do anything for God. Amen. Listen, brother, there's work in serving God. The Bible, God Paul called it labor. I'm not working for men. Sometimes I get discouraged in this day and hour about how little work goes on for Jesus, but that's not for me to decide. My job is to do what God's called me to do, and other men have to do what they, they're called to do. But I know it's work, and I love working for the Lord. Our Lord went bloody. On Calvary's cross, He was beaten unrecognizably. All His bones stared at Him, every bone out of joint. I mean beat to the point of death. And brother, then you tell me Ricky Cothran can't give his life and work for a Savior. I don't have to do that. No, sir, Jesus died for me. He'll take me to heaven if I never do another thing for him. But I want to do something for him because I love him. Praise God, I love him. Amen. And here's David. David got up, and I believe David loved those sheep. He got right in there with them. He, by the way, do you love the job you do? So I said, well, you know, you ever heard this? Well, I'm just making eight today, making eight hours today. Listen, I don't just make eight. I love to do. But one fellow said this, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. You know what? I, I really love what I do. I thank God for the ministry that got started here, that puts food on my table, the churches that support us. And I'll promise you, I don't lay around doing nothing, friend. Amen. I work, I work here at the office. I work at the house. I thank God for it. I love it. I didn't used to always have a work ethic. I've talked to you about that on another message. I won't get into all that today. But I tell you, David's work ethic was hard work. Amen. He had courage. He trusted in God. Amen. He had a rod and a staff. Well, then we move on now. I, I, I move on to another area of David. Not only was he a son, not only was he a shepherd. Number three, and I'll spend some time here a little bit. David was a singer. David loved to sing. I can't do much singing, but I sure do love to try to sing. Amen. Uh, there was some men many years ago. We had just started in the church, and 
I turned the TV on one Sunday morning, and there were four men out of the mountains of North Carolina that were singing clean, good gospel music. Amen. And I began to like those men, and we began to go hear them sing, and we followed them all over the country, and uh, our part of the country. And so me and my brother began to pick their songs up, and we began to sing what they sang. And I'll tell you, they were a great influence on my life. Amen. I've, I've had the privilege of, of telling some of those men uh, 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 some things about how they've influenced me. But let me say this to you, that God, my friend, uh, 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 God uh, just, uh, he gave my mama a talent to sing. My mama had one of the most clear voices of anybody I ever heard. I found some cassette tapes of her not long ago singing. I mean, she had a clear voice. And so I remember, I've told you this story, but my mama got saved in 1975 and and uh, I, I was out there on a little swing set one afternoon swinging, and I heard something in the house. And I went in there. I said, Mama, what are you doing? And she said, Son, she said, I got saved. And said, I promised the Lord. Or she said, I promised the Lord I'll sing five songs a day to Him. Now, she didn't know her Bible much. She's just trying to grow in the Lord. She didn't know it, but she knew to sing. Boy, I tell you what, I thank God for Mama. Amen. She'd sing some of them old songs. Amen. I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. And when my ship comes in, I'll leave this world of sin and go sailing through the air. I heard my mama sing that many a time. I've heard her sing that, boy. Amen. I get them old songs, amen, she'd sing. I tell you right now, amen, I love to hear her sing. I remember that brings back a lot of memories. I'd love to hear onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. She'd sing that. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm about to get happy. I mean, I love music. I love singing, don't you? Now, David was a singer. David penned down many of the psalms, which are poems that have been put to music. David was a singer. Now, I, I want you to notice this. Amen. David sung. Now, the word sing is found 56 times in the book of Psalms. Amen. Now, uh, David, David was a, a, a singer. He loved to sing. And he, he wrote in Psalm 7, in verse number 1, he said this. David said this, I will praise the Lord according to His righteousness. And will sing praise uh, to the name of the Lord Most High. Now somebody said that he wrote this psalm while he was running from Saul. But David said, I'm going to sing. He said, I'm going to sing to the Lord. Amen. Now you may not like to hear me sing, and that's okay if you, I sing to the Lord. Amen. David said again, he said, I will, he said, I will praise the Lord. What about that? According to his righteousness. Boy, I tell you what, that's enough to praise him all day, ain't it? And will sing praise to the name of the Lord uh, Most High. Brother Roloff said that one time that uh, the, uh, the BBC was going to do an interview with his homes. And Brother Roloff loved singing. He would t train those girls and those boys to sing. You remember, he'd have the Honey Bee Quartet. They'd sing. And they'd sing. All, and I, I, as a matter of fact, I think someone was with him in that airplane when he crashed in 1982. And uh, uh, he said that that British fella came down there to interview the homes. And he said that they, they just carried on like normal, you know. And said that, that British fellow with the BBC said, I don't understand it. The whole crowd breaketh forth in singing. Amen. Hallelujah. I understand it. It's called being saved by grace. Amen. Now, I used to sing, but I didn't understand what I was singing about. But when I got saved, thank God I got saved, January 22nd, 1978, and I began learning a song that day. Since I heard about a better home, I would leave this old world with all it owns. Just slip away most any day to heaven's shore. I'll find sweet rest beyond the gates forevermore. That's the first song I learned when I got saved. Amen. Call When I Get Home. That's the name of the song. Now, listen to me. I, amen. God put a song in my heart when I got saved. Amen. Amen. God, it may not be attuned to you, but God put a song in my heart. David was a singer. Amen. Thank God for singing. I believe the Bible commands us to sing. Amen. Amen. One fellow said, uh, if, you, if you can sing and won't sing, you ought to be sent to sing, sing, and made to sing. Amen. That's what he said. But, but I believe this. I believe, I believe that singing is a good mark of salvation. I do. Singing the right, David sung the right thing, man. He loves singing. By the way, did you know good Gospel singing will prepare the heart for the preaching of the Word of God. God help us. In this hour 
I'm going to say something now. It's going to make some of you mad at me. So you hang on just a minute here, all right? If you're in a car, tighten your seatbelt a little bit so you don't get mad at me. Just take a deep breath now so your blood pressure don't go up real high, okay? But it's a sad day when the, when the modern southern gospel music and the contemporary music is dictating our worship services at church. It's a sad day when our young people only know contemporary songs and they sing that. Let me say this. What is wrong with the old songs? What is wrong with I'll meet you in the morning? What's wrong with amazing grace? What's wrong with blessed assurance? What's wrong with these old hymns like Onward Christian Soldiers Marching Astro? Oh, you say, preacher, that's old-fashioned wrong. That's just good old-time music. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong. By the way, should not we be teaching our children to sing the same songs we sing? We get our kids up and they sing some contemporary stuff and we clap for them like they're entertainers on a stage. And brother, what you don't realize what you're doing there is you are pushing that kid into entertainment instead of for God. I'd rather see a kid get up and cry all the way through a song and sing a right song than I would to get up and sing some contemporary thing and the house start clapping and all that. I, I'm telling you something, brother. i tell you something. It's, we've, we've got to get back to old time singing. Got to get back to it. We've got to get back to it. Amen. It, it, it's part of our heritage in America. And more than that, it's, it's, it's God's right. God's songs are right. Amen. I'm going to show what the Bible said. By the way, did you know music? And I'm just going to give you this. Did you know music is misused? Now, David was a singer. Now, David knew that music could be used for good or bad. Do you know the devil was a master? He is, present tense, a master musician. One fellow said this. He said the devil can carry four-part harmony by himself. I believe that. The devil, if you study Ezekiel, he talks about his pipes and his tabrets. That's the word. You get your uh, word tambourine from, the beat. That's where you get it from, all right? But anyway, here is um, here's the devil, a master musician. You think the devil ain't got in our music today? Well, I, 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 I've heard this. I, I, you know, preachers will say something like this. Well, I preach the same thing I used to preach. But our music is different to reach the young people. I am against that. I want you to know, write it down, Catherine's against that. I think the young people ought to learn the same songs the old people learn because if they don't, how are they going to carry them on in the next generation? If you keep your kids learning contemporary music all the time and suddenly when they get 18, you shove them out into adult church, which is more conservative, as you would call it, or more old-fashioned, whatever you want to call it, those kids ain't going to know what to do and they ain't going to stay there. And don't get mad at me. I'm just trying to help you, okay? Now, that's the worst of it. We're over. Now, you can loosen that seatbelt and take one more deep breath if you're riding down the road and you'll be okay. I love you. Okay? This is the only radio broadcast you can get a sermon and get, well, never mind. But anyway, I, I love you. Amen. Hey, but here's the thing. You know I love you. All of you know that. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. David was a singer. Now, what did the Bible say about singing? Colossians chapter number three. I like this. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, right here it is. Let the Word of Christ, that King James Bible, get in you, let it dwell. Then he said, in all wisdom. Now, watch this. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making, uh, singing, well, let me, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, let, 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 me, just, let me just tell you this. That David was a man that, that David uh, was a singer. And I believe his songs uh, that that he sang, that, that I believe they, they were from God. They were inspired of God. Now, the Bible said that we are to fill ourselves with the Word of God and then to sing. Now, if we'd fill ourselves with the Word of God, we would not have to worry about all of this contemporary music that's not of God. Because the Bible would show us there are songs written today. And I, I don't mean to be ugly. We operate, by the way, somebody said, well, Catherine's against singing. No, we operate radio stations. We got thousands of songs in our computer. I'm not against singing. But I'll tell you what I am against. I'm against the wrong kind of singing. But I believe the right kind of singing can please the Lord. In Ephesians, the Bible talked about singing with melody. Now, melody is a twanging sound or what's pleasant to the ear are produced in the rules of rhythm. Amen. And, and you, can, you can find the, in the English Webster's Dictionary, you can find the definition of melody. Amen. And so uh, the, these songs that are put out today, they have, no, they have no rhythm to them. They have no pleasant sound to them. As one fellow said, a hound dog 
could bark better than some of this singing today. Amen. I'm not being ugly. I'm just simply saying we want the beat. We want it loud. People, turn it up. Turn it up. We go in our churches. You're there to worship. I'm not being ugly. If you play music before the service, that is your business. But I'm going to tell you this. I don't think you ought to play music so loud they can hear it three blocks down before the church starts. Amen. Oh, we want it. We want it loud, preacher. Well, sometimes God don't work like that. Amen. You'll find that God works sometimes in the quiet. Amen. God works sometimes in the opposite of what we do. But let me get back on the positive side. David was a singer. And David loved singing. And David filled himself with the Word of God. Because God would use him later to write the Psalms, you see. And, uh, and, and as David was pinning these Psalms down, uh, then God used these Psalms as Scripture. Amen. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on here in the study. But David was a singer. I just want to say this, and, and then we'll go on. But I believe this. Uh, I, I believe that when you sing for God, I believe you ought to sing with the right motive in mind. We're not to sing to get an audience. We're not to sing to get a pat on the back. We're not to sing to, uh, to get somebody to, uh, you know, to tell us how good we are. But we're to, we're to sing, my friend, to, uh, to please God. The Bible said, speaking unto yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What are we to do? We're to speak to ourselves. Amen. We're to speak to ourselves. All right. So let me go on here. And I'm, I'm going to get now to where I need to be here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on because I've spent a lot of time. I don't want to be negative now. Now, number four, I want to give you this one today. David uh, is, uh, uh, well, let me just go back here. I've, I found some more pages here in my notes. Amen. I got kind of tangled up, but I want to read to you Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms, and the Bible said in hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And I really ought to give you the definition of melody, but in the Greek it means to touch or to, uh, to strike the uh, chord. Uh, and then, of course, and I, I talked to you about that in the English with the, with the laws of rhythm. So David, David did his singing that pleased God. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and that's the key to it. Spiritual songs, amen. All right, so now, uh, we, we thank God for that. Then I, I, I got one more thing here um, that, that, uh, that I, I want to say to you, that when you're singing for God, it'll bless somebody else. The Bible said that we're to teach one another in songs. Amen. And so David was a great uh, singer. And so we'll leave it at that. All right, we'll leave it at that. All right, now, so now we number, come to number four. And we'll, we'll close out right here today on this subject. And I don't have a lot of time, so maybe I can get all this in the next 10 minutes. I hope to do that. So number four, let me share this with you. David was a writer. Now, it is believed that David probably wrote se- at least 75 of the Psalms. David is given credit for 73 Psalms. And then in the New Testament, we find the references that we know of Psalm 2 and Psalm 95 that David also wrote would have made 75 Psalms that David wrote. Now, let me read to you from 2 Samuel 23, verse number 1. The Bible said, And these be the last words of David. The Bible said, David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God, of ja- uh, 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 of the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said. Now, I give a little outline on this verse here, and I want to share it with you for just a minute. Uh, 2 Samuel 23, 1. I want to give you the little outline that I made on this verse. First of all, I see the servant here. He said, verse 1, Now these be the last words of David. David was just a servant. Now, uh, he, he pinned down uh, things in the Bible. He pinned down uh, other books besides uh, uh, the Psalms. Amen. Uh, Samuel recorded some of his writings there. And so David was a great writer. David knew, by the way, not everybody can write. Some people would be horrible at writing. But if you can write, you ought to write. Amen? And you ought to do what God has called you to do. I want to say this to you. God is looking for people that He can uh, get them to use the talents that God has given them. One of my talents over the years is writing poems. I can, I can make anything rhyme. I was remember years ago, I was there in the, uh, uh, the radio building, and a young lady was working for us, and, and I told her, I said, you can... Name me any subject, and I can make something rhyme with it. She said something, and I don't remember what it was, and I, I made a big thing and made it rhyme. And she said, how in the world do you do that? Well, God's been on my case about something lately. If I can do that, just 
you know, telling people, if you say tree and I can make it rhyme with me or I can make it rhyme with thee, uh, you know, or I make, make it rhyme with a bumblebee, climb the tree, amen, whatever. If I, why can't I write poems for God's glory? So the other day I got me a little thing and I started, I started pinning down what God gave me. Amen. I, I like to write things that God has given me. Amen. So you can do it. If you got a, if you got a talent for poetry or for books, you ought to write and do it. God. So now then I see the servant here. He said there in verse one, and then I see the son. The Bible said, uh, uh, David remembered where he came from. Verse number one, David, the son of, uh, Jesse said, in Psalm 23, 1, David already been king of Israel, but he sure remembered his humble beginning. Thank God that he remembered his humble beginning. Amen. Then I noticed the sovereign in verse number one. He said, the man who was raised up on high. Oh, God raised him up. God put David on the throne. Nobody else put David on the throne, but God put him on the throne. Amen. And then I noticed the spirit of God. Amen. That dwelt in in verse number one. The anointed of God, uh, of the God of Jacob. David realized he was anointed of God. David realized, and I don't know if David realized that what he was writing would be Scripture or not. I have no idea if David realized his writings would be Scripture. But I want to point out a verse in the Bible to you. I want you to point this out to you. Second Peter chapter number 1, verse number 21. The Bible says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, one writer said that that has the idea of a sailboat on an ocean. And that sailboat does not move until the wind blows it. God help us in our lives, preachers, deacons, choir leaders, lay members, ladies, children, everybody, that we would not move on anything until God moves. We have too many ideas. Preachers have too many ideas. Idleness will make you have ideas. If you've got nothing to do and sit around and all you do is just get three minutes a week, you're going to have so many ideas you're going to try to put on your church and they won't work. I'm going to tell you, you need to spend your time in the Bible in prayer. You spend time in prayer to cut down on your ideas. I promise you on that. We don't need more ideas. We just need more God telling us what to do and when to do it. I, I You know, I have some ideas sometimes about things I'm going to preach. And uh, God, God don't ever let me do that the way I want to do it. And God reminded me the other day, he said, son, he said, I'm in charge of the preaching. I know when you ought to preach this and when you ought to preach that on radio. You know, I've been wanting to do something on David for over 40 years. I'm not doing it the way I wanted to do it. When I first started this, I I, I thought it would go a different way. But I tell you this, God's allowed me to do it. It's one of the greatest studies I've ever studied. And I'm so happy about it. I thank God that he's let me do it. But David was a writer and he was moved by the Holy Ghost. Now I noticed the word sweet here. He said, the Bible said this, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. And that word sweet means pleasant, delightful, or agreeable. Now David's writings in the Psalms have comforted so many people. Amen. I mean, they've comforted so many people. How many people have read Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Amen. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I mean, how many people has read that? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I read that Psalm the other day. There's nothing wrong with reading that. I I read that Psalm in a funeral the other day. And, and, And to a dear lady that I had her service, I read that psalm the other day, a comforting psalm. God said, I'm going to be with you. Amen. I'm with you. By the way, the shadow of a knife can't stab you, and the shadow of a gun can't shoot you, and the shadow of a sword can't cut you. And brother, he said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. And that's the spiritual type sometimes of where we walk, but God's with you. Boy, these psalms, they were agreeable words. The sweet psalmist of Israel. How about that? Amen. The sweet psalmist of Israel. And then I thought about God saying about how that Israel sucked honey out of the rock. And I thought about God comparing the Bible as sweet as honey. You know, honey works in your system as an antibiotic. I don't know if you know that or not, but if you eat honey, it will work in your system as an antibiotic. It'll help you with infections and different things. And so I've been eating some honey. I've been drinking some some honey and juice and stuff in my voice lately. And, And brother, I'm telling you this. Amen. God's got natural remedies, amen, sometimes to help us out there, right? If you'll just read your Bible, you know what works and what don't. But I wrote down, I'm going to leave you with this little outline. I wrote down a little outline using the word sweet, S-W-E-E-T. And I wrote down just, just these little things about David's words, what they did. You know what they were? They were words of salvation. 
Did you know if you read the Psalms, you'll find enough gospel in there to get saved? In Psalm 2, he talked about how that we ought to kiss the son lest he smite thee. Amen. I mean, it's talking about, uh, listen, that we are, to, we are to lean on God while we can. He talked about the heathens, you know, how they rage against God. But salvation is for them, for all. Amen. And the psalmist uh, talked about salvation. Then the W, the Psalms were filled with worship. David talks about worshiping toward thy holy temple. The Psalms are filled with worship. Thank God that they are. Amen. And then the Psalms are filled with, with uh, enlightenment. Amen. The prophecy of Christ. Remember what he said in Psalm 110? The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. I mean, David prophesied of the coming Messiah. David prophesied of Calvary. David saw a foretaste of Calvary. And you'll find that in the Psalm. Sweet things. Amen. S-W-E. Salvation. Worship. Enlightenment. And then the second E. You'll find encouragement in the Psalms. Amen. Boy, you can be down, you can read a Psalm, and you can find encouragement. And then the last thing, you can find truth, the Word of God. I believe he said in Psalm 138, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. You'll find this in the Psalms. David, the great psalmist of Israel. What a blessing. Thank God for the life of David. I'm going to continue on the next message. I hope we're not boring you with these, but I hope, listen, sinner friend, if you're not saved, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then if you are saved by the grace of God, I hope that you'll get where God wants you and let God use you today. All right. Father, I thank you for the message. I pray you'll use it. Thank you for letting me preach it this side of heaven and have your will your way now in Jesus name. Amen.